I've got that started on. And um, so what we're going to do just to kind of give you the, the format of the presentation or the panel, I should say, is that um, I'm going to introduce everybody and then um, let them introduce themselves and talk a little bit about what they do and how they got their start. And then I'm going to ask a few more questions and then I'm going to open up the questions to all of you. So um, I want you to feel free to use the chat to put questions in um, when you'd like to. Um, and I'll get to them at the end and, and try to get to as many of them as we possibly can. Um, so we will do as best as we can. And man, y'all rolling in, this is great. Um, so what I'm gonna do right now is just do a brief introduction. And, and, and first of all, I just wanna say thank you to all of our panelists. I, I know all of you are incredibly busy professionals, um, you know, doing fantastic work. And so the fact that you took the time to talk to some of our students and our faculty and staff really, really means a lot. So thank you so much for that. Mm -hmm. um, for all of you that, 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 that don't know me, I'm Ross Wade. I'm one of the career advisors for the School of Communications. Um, you probably get the big list, as we call it, from either Allison or myself every couple of weeks. So keep an eye out for that because it's got events like this, internships, jobs, etc. Um, but right now, let's go ahead and introduce folks. So I'm going to actually start out with Mike Dodson, who graduated in 2010, and he's a creative coordinator at Netflix. Thanks for being here, Mike. And then I want to go to Erin Barnett, who's actually a freelance documentary editor. Um, she was here actually my first year at Elon as a career advisor, um, and she's worked on a couple, well, actually many great projects, including The Great Hack which you can find on Netflix and this true crime documentary series that I got sucked into and didn't realize that she was one of the editors until the end I was done and it's really good. It's called I'll Be Gone in the Dark and it's on HBO. And then we have uh, Eric Kendall who graduated in 11. Uh, he's a producer for the Charlotte Hornets and it's also done a lot of other great broadcasting stuff um, and it's been you know, great and has, has been on past panels before. And then finally, I'm really excited to introduce uh, Rachel Ramist, and um, she has a thousand jobs and she does them all well. Um, she's actually a television director and producer in Los Angeles. She's, she, she's actually in Montreal right now in some kind of blizzard working on a project for the CW, but she also works with Elon and she's the new academic director for the Elon in Los Angeles program. So again, thanks to all of you for being here. I'm very excited to have you here. Um, and, and Rachel, I'll just start with you. So if you could tell us a little bit about your, your career in television and TV um, and how you got your start and a little bit about what you do right now. Absolutely. So um, I am currently, as of January 1st, an associate professor of cinema and television at Elon, just based in Los Angeles. And as Ross shared, I am the new academic director of Elon in Los Angeles. I teach courses for Elon in writing for cinema and television, a course in diversity and equity. I'm going to co-teach the Sundance class with Jay McMurdy, who is on this uh, Zoom. And he has been just the leader of Elon in Los Angeles and really forging a pipeline from campus to industry. And so I'm here to help expand that mission. And so in terms of my own career, I'm a film school kid. I went to UCLA. I did a BA and MFA in directing from UCLA and uh, went right into the industry working on music videos and big budget features and those sorts of things. And I was sort of doing that climb up the ladder, but I was also a young mom and Hollywood wasn't so supportive of mothers at that point in time. And so a lot of my professional work was in the area of music. So I directed, produced, shot, edited lots of music content, predominantly in hip hop. I wrote for every music magazine, vibe, source, herb, things that don't exist anymore, but were like the things in the 90s. And I used to shoot a lot of concerts, live events, those kinds of things, and then grew up to be a professor. And so I have taught at many schools, including 12 years at the University of Alabama, where I was tenured. I ran the amphitheater in Tuscaloosa, doing all of the concerts and training my students in multi-camera. And um, then a couple years ago, not that long ago, three years ago, in fact, 
I got a phone call. It says I got muted. A uh, phone call from an old friend who I've known for 20, 25 years, who I knew through hip hop. And on the other side of the phone was Ava DuVernay. Hey girl, what you doing? It's time. I said, time for what? She said, it's time for you to direct television. And that's when I got my first episode was, uh, I directed Queen Sugar, uh, Ava's show for OWN, the Oprah Winfrey Network. And that really propelled my most recent career as an episodic television director where I did Queen Sugar, then I did Greenleaf also for OWN, then I did Roswell, New Mexico for the CW, then I did Nancy Drew for the CW, then two more episodes of Roswell, I did Diary of a Future President for Disney Plus, uh, I went back, as I said, to Roswell, now I am on a brand new CW show called Republic of Sarah, and the, the short version is the relationships that you make now, the people who are sitting to your left and your right are the people you're going to grow up in the industry with and they may be the people who call you to hire you and so i've been very lucky in the many pathways that i've had in careers in music and live events and in academia and then getting a phone call to come back at my age to direct episodic television so that is me in a in a short version Great, thank you so much, Rachel. That's that's wonderful. All right, Aaron, I'm going to throw the ball to you. All right. Uh, so yeah, as Ross said, my name's Aaron, and I'm a documentary editor and writer, uh, both episodic and feature length films. I graduated from Elon in 2009. Uh, you know, got my start in Fresh TV with good old Jay McMurdy here. So good to see him again. And uh, yeah. After I graduated, uh, Jay had given me the advice, actually, that I should uh, look at the films that I liked, like, look, look, at, look at what I liked, and yeah, like, network and do all that, but also, I didn't know very many people yet, so he recommended I just cold cover letter the people whose work I respected and send resumes with the assumption that I would hear back from almost none of them, but you never know. And it just so happened that uh, Alex Gibney's company, Jigsaw Productions, was looking for an assistant to Alex. And they had actually posted an ad, but had gotten so many responses. They were overwhelmed by the responses. And they were like, well, we had saved this resume, so why don't we reach out to her? So it was very lucky. But I got my foot in the door. And that's the hardest thing to do is to get your foot in the door. And then you just have to take advantage of it. So. Um, did very basic assistant work for him for about a year and in the meantime took advantage of all of the brilliant much more experienced people around me by you know sitting down to lunch with them and most of the time having casual conversations but then every once in a while strategically slipping in the the industry questions and the oh can i sit in your edit one day and I won't be a bother and all of that, but it's the key to do it like strategically so you don't, you know, annoy them. So I did that over the course of a year and then Alex called me in and said, hey, you know, you're not going to be in this position forever. What do you want to do next? And I actually realized I hadn't thought about what I wanted to do next. So definitely think about what you want to do next. But I also realized that I needed to say something or I was going to be on no trajectory. So I quickly went through my head, well, I have a bad back, I don't think cameras, uh, producing, I don't want to talk with people that often. Uh, so I said editing. Um, and so then he uh, said, great, well, why don't you shadow our assistant editor and we'll start transitioning you off to do assistant editing. And it was a very lucky time to be transitioned onto that because there were brilliant editors going through the much smaller Jigsaw Productions at the time. There was Sloan Clevin who edited the Academy Award winning doc Taxi to the Dark Side, Allison Elwood who um, edited Gonzo and Magic Trip and Enron's Smartest Guys in the Room, uh, and Chad Beck who, who also edited an Academy Award winning film. So I was like, yes. Um, and so I just worked really hard for each of them on several projects. Sorry, just resituating. These chairs get very uncomfortable over the course of the day. Um, worked with them for several years and slowly began cutting some scenes for them as well. Uh, and then 
I found that the main way a junior editor gets their shot are experienced editors turning down jobs that aren't going to pay them well enough. And uh, so I was really lucky that the editors lifted me up and, and there was a situation with a film called Food Chains that Alison Elwood said, look, this sounds like a great film. I'm not the right editor for you. I'll be a supervising editor if you'll give this, this young woman Aaron a shot. And they gave me a shot and uh, we got into Berlin and Tribeca and uh, did a pretty good, pretty good uh, limited US premiere circuit uh, and things snowballed from there. It was still a process of, you know, going, not always getting to choose the films, the, the content I wanted to work on every time. Uh, but as things have progressed and things I've worked on have gained more notoriety, uh, it's a privilege I've increasingly had. And so in recent years, I did Unseen Enemy a few years ago about the impending doom of a pandemic. Oops, more people perhaps should have watched. Um, <laughs> and uh, then um, The Great Hack, uh, and most recently All Be Gone in the Dark. And I've been feeling a little editing burnout, and so actually the current project I'm on is with the same company that did Story Syndicate. Uh, it's an unannounced project, so I can't say what it is yet, but I'm on that fully as a writer, post supervisor, story producer. So just want to give myself a little more flexibility and diversity of how I tell stories. Great, Aaron, thank you so much. All right, Mike, I'm gonna pass the mic on to you, sir. Sure, thanks for having me. Uh, hey y'all, Mike Dotson here. I uh, graduated in Elon in 2010, and I think my story, I can definitely vouch for both Aaron and Rachel and their anecdotes, because uh, all of the above applies to me. Um, started out, getting a, a great internship at Jazz Times Magazine uh, back before I graduated, um, only to be told one day after I moved to DC that they went bankrupt uh, and I essentially lost the internship. So I scrambled back to career services and I said, is there anything that's available? I'm in DC, I can't tell my girlfriend that I got like fired on my first day. So like, I need something. Uh, lo and behold, um, Discovery was looking for an intern but had missed the deadline. Uh, and they were the only ones who were without intern I said, whatever it is, I'll take it. I don't care. Um, went there and, and interned at Discovery Channel back in, in 2009. Um, and then after the internship, they, they liked me and they said that, hey, we have a, a new network launching next year with Oprah Winfrey. Uh, if you'd like to come back, um, we're looking for a PA full time. And I said, yeah, no problem at all. Uh, so I moved to, to New York shortly after graduation to work uh, there during the launch years, 2010-2011 uh, at Oprah Winfrey Network um, as a PA, just kind of working on um, all the shows, mostly like the, the Tyler Perry stuff that they had coming out at the time, um, Sweetie Pies and some of the other like flagship ones, Masterclass and some of those, those sorts. Uh, so very, very cool experience. Um, and then also kind of, you know, as Rachel said, the people you sit next to are the people that make it happen for you. And I was looking for kind of my next, uh, my next adventure and the person I shared a cube with, her sister was uh, an EP at Al Jazeera and wanted me to possibly come and be a coordinator with her at Al Jazeera. I said, yeah, totally, that sounds perfect. Uh, put in my notice at Discovery. Uh, and then about, I think maybe two weeks after that, Al Jazeera laid off about like a hundred people at Al Jazeera America. <laughs> so then um, she said, but it's no problem. I'm going to China Global Television Network and I'm gonna produce a show called Full Frame there. If you wanna be uh, on my team, you can. Uh, and that was kind of where I really kind of cut my teeth in production. I was producing a studio talk show called Full Frame uh, for CGTN. Um, it, was, it was really awesome. We were producing from studios in London, New York, and, and LA. Uh, I got to work with Common, uh, Susan Sarandon, Yao Ming, um, a bunch of, of awesome celebrities um, in studio. And I was producing and, and segment producing for them as well for a few years. Um, we were a team of five for a small Chinese news network and we ended up winning like a news documentary Emmy for a piece that we produced called um, Can't is a four letter word. Uh, and we were up against ESPN and all kinds of other bigger people. And it was really funny because uh, the EP said that when she took the job, they told her she'll never win awards. They're like, well, why are you going to this small network? It's, it's international. Um, and she you know, wanted to be part of a small, awesome team and she built it and, and, and we were really successful. So that was great. Um, it you know afforded me the chance to go to Europe. I spent some time uh, in Brussels working for them as well on stories for a bit over a year and that was really awesome too. And 
about 2016 or 17 or so, decided to come back to, to the U.S. and, and uh, do the freelance thing. So that was kind of when I moved out west. Um, and it was just freelancing, producing at, at different commercial houses and studios. Um, and I think that's kind of the, the more recent, the more interesting part of my career for sure has just been kind of uh, a bit of self-employment, a bit of freelancing, a bit of contract work for different production companies in LA. And uh, most recently, as, as Ross said, now I'm, I'm working um, on a, a, a team at Netflix called Ad Laboratory. Uh, as a creative coordinator, and we are specializing in making um, advertisements for our foreign markets. So uh, I make commercials in Japanese and Brazilian and Brazilian Portuguese, and also um, for the Indian market as well. Um, so yeah, I mean, to piggyback what they said, I think just you know always be open for opportunities with with each other, and and you know being a producer especially is is all about who you know, and it's great to just come up with a with a really strong cohort um, as you will at Elon. Um, I know I definitely call a lot of my fellow Elon grads as well. I'm still in, in great contact with them and um, I think you know as you'll hear a common thread with all of us is it's definitely just being open to opportunity and seeing where it kind of takes you. All right Mike, thank you so much. And Eric, I'm gonna pass the mic on to you, sir. Okay. Um, hi guys, Eric Kendall. Thanks for having me. Um, one thing I love about Elon is always the participation outside of class. This is always something that's really cool that I remember doing and just something that I think is a little unique to, maybe not to Elon, but it's all I know. You guys, thanks for taking the extra time. It, it is about this sort of thing that you make time for that makes the difference down the road, I promise you, because uh, you'll be willing to do that little extra that others won't. So um, just wanted to say that off the top. Uh, honestly, I'm, I'm really, uh, really honored to be among uh, the other panelists, you know, a couple of things that they've said that really ring true with me, obviously, the, the resilient um, nature of media business is one that is, you know, everybody has to have, you've noticed, you know, from from Aaron and Mike and Rachel, that they, they've named off a couple of different places they've been. And, you know, their careers are still young, for the most part. And it's really like, you got to keep rolling with it because think like, especially in, in Mike's story, you just keep rolling with it. And my story is uh, sort of similar. You know, I, I'm all, I've always been a sports fan and I, I always will. It's a big part of my job. It's whatever I tell people that want to get into sports broadcast or anything within sports is you, you got to be a fan first and you got to consume that sort of stuff. Um, you know, Aaron said it with, uh, you know, Jay's recommendation of call the people that you like their work. Um, and you have a big library of it because you consume it. Uh, that's, that's a big part of getting into the media industry in a, in a particular way. So I'm a big sports fan. I did the same thing uh, looking for internships between, you know, junior and senior year, put them out all over the place from little small, I, I interned actually between sophomore and junior year at, a, at the Times News in Burlington, um, just running around being their digital reporter with a little camera. And then the next summer actually got an internship with CBS Sports in New York, which was kind of surprising to me. I had no, you know, I didn't have any real connections there, but uh, I think some of the things I put on my resume and some of the things I put out there, uh, you know, kind of hit a note. We can get to that later, but went to CBS Sports, did a summer there, drank it up, stayed in contact with those people that I was, you know, that I was with. Um, both other interns as well as people that have worked there for a little while to people that are producers and and even above that bugging them every now and then anytime there was an event so so I came back to Elon for my senior year anytime there was an event that CBS produced whether it was the Carolina Panthers the you know the Tar Heel basketball or if I knew they were around I said can I just come and hang in the truck and lean on the wall um, and usually, usually you get a yes to that. Um, so I, I did that. I saw there was a job opening the next summer coming out. I applied for it, got it, went to New York. Kid from, I'm from Hickory, North Carolina, by the way. Go to New York. I'm in there with those guys doing live television, um, live sports television, which is kind of a dream job, but you realize pretty suddenly that it's, uh, there's a lot of grit to it. There's a lot of underbelly to, um, to the presentation that eventually makes it to your TV screen. 
Um, but I still liked it. So that was a good sign. I mean, it, it wasn't something that scared me away. Um, you know, worked, worked at CBS for about 10 months through football season. I traveled with the SEC on CBS crew um, doing college football. Um, went on and was in the studio for the NCAA basketball tournament the first year that CBS and Turner had merged to cover that tournament. So that was interesting and, and actually opened up a lot of other connections because now you're talking to another, you know, sports, um, sports broadcasting entity and you're not just totally in your CBS bubble. So that ended up being a, a big deal for me. Um, but honestly, my big break came when I got a phone call. I was in the CBS studio, got a phone call from a producer in Atlanta who I actually called when I was a student at Elon. Um, uh, my professor, Max Negan, who, uh, who some of you may know, he set me up with a guy whose name was, was Joe Vencius, who was the producer of the Atlanta Braves. And I called him when I was about to do like a, one of our student television shows. I called him and asked for advice. And, you know, you're a producer, you do it at the highest level. How can I take some of that? Um, and I, I guess he remembered that. He had an opening uh, a year later. He needed, a, he needed an AD on his Atlanta Braves, uh, on his Atlanta Braves broadcast, and he thought of me. Um, and I was itching to get back down south. I mean, New York is great to start off and make connections, but it wasn't my style. Um, so I went down to Atlanta after, after 10 months. Uh, it worked out. I didn't have to like quit or anything. There's, there's a system with CBS of you, uh, you know, you're kind of a freelance worker. And then the summer that all they do is golf. So everybody else has to take off no matter what. So I went down to Atlanta, worked some Braves games, got introduced to some of the people at the network, Fox Sports South, who does Braves broadcasts and other regional sports. Um, and they actually ended up having, after, after I was there for a month as a freelancer, they had an opening that, at a staff job for a full-time AD that, that I took. And I've, I've put my hooks in uh, Fox Sports South ever since. Uh, got some opportunities here and there. Worked my first job as a producer, I guess it was like six years ago now, doing women's ACC soccer um, and thought it was the Super Bowl. I mean, it was, it was really exciting uh, to get my own show and have to direct like 10 different people. Um, and, you know, every year it'd give me a little more on my plate, do a little bigger events. Uh, got to do some Braves pre and post game shows as a producer, got to do ACC basketball as a producer. Um, they had me fill in on a number of NBA games. And then this last, uh, this last summer, um, the opening came up for the Charlotte Hornets job, which uh, I moved from Atlanta back to the Charlotte area uh, with my wife and, and my newborn. And uh, so far we're, we're 29 games in, just had a couple postponed. But that's how it goes. Um, but no, it's it, it's been great. It's it's uh, I wouldn't do it any different. Um, and you know, for for those of you who are kind of uh, interested in the live TV, uh, in the live TV realm, you know, it, it's a it's a different animal. Uh, maybe we'll get into it here. But um, I, to to kind of close my part, I'm just I'm glad that I'm here listening to some of the other panelists and some of because that's that's the best part about this is. You know, I don't have any answers that any of you don't, you know, uh, yeah, I've lived a, a little longer and I've had a few other experiences, but I, I love just sitting on these and, and hearing more. So uh, I'll, I'll sit here like the rest of you and listen. Eric, thank you. That was great. Um, and, and just to summarize, all of you gave some really great pointers and and I feel like I heard some consistency with a few things. And so I, I just want to highlight them a little bit. And the, the first one is do good work or do great work. Um, that's really, really important. Um, the second thing I heard is that you need to play well with others and don't be a jerk because the people that you're sitting beside now could be the person that hires you 10 years from now. Um, be adaptable. That came up over and over and over again. Um, and I really appreciated that one. Uh, and also connect with and learn from people in your industry that are doing great work. Um, like Aaron talked about shadowing people and Eric talked about um, talking to producers. And, and so that seems like something that popped up a lot. And my favorite one, and several of you graduated during what was called the Great Recession, where jobs were few and far between, but you all found 
really good jobs and you found them without having some gold car, big wig connection. You, you, you got it through hard work and persistence. And I think that's a really important thing that we highlight right now as well. Um, so, so thank you for that great information. Um, and I want to ask one kind of bigger, pic, bigger picture question. I did it again, Aaron. Um, is each of you are in different parts of the country. Like some of you are, are in the same part, but, but as far as getting into the industry and what that looks like in Los Angeles versus Atlanta versus New York, how does one do that? And for all of our students here that are like, I'm just a sophomore, I do, you know, Elon News Network and, you know, one other thing, how in the world do I get to the place where I could get some great internship? What feedback or advice would you have for them? So kind of like the networking scene in your area and then breaking into the biz and then ways to maximize Elon while they're here. And Erin, I'm going to start with you, actually. All right. Well, I'm sure the other panelists will have stuff to add to this, but um, I think one of the main things is, is, you know, use your professors as resources because they've seen who's come through the program and, and kept tabs with what everyone's doing. And something that I do anytime I start a new job is I touch base back with Nicole Trich and I say, hey, you know, who was awesome the last few years? I, you know, we're looking for internships, we're looking for PA or interns, we're looking for PAs. And she's always very discerning about which names she passes along. And I really appreciate that because as soon as I get a name, I know I trust that name. And so, you know, be one of those people that your professor wants to pass your name along. And usually what it comes down to is those professors are looking for people who work hard, who throw a lot of, who show a lot of curiosity, who make things while they're at Elon um, and show that tenacity uh, and who ask questions and, you know, think critically. So, um, and, and, you know, just this, just in the last couple of months, I, I sent Nicole an email and she sent me a recommendation of someone who graduated last year. And that person is now the PA on the series I'm working on. Um, so I think, I think a lot of times as a student, I would think to myself like, oh, how can I get connected with the alumni? I, I, I don't want to nag them and stuff, but, or who do I even reach out to? Who are those people? The professors know who those people are. Um, and as far as having the right experience, you know, it's, it's so, it's so tough because a lot of, a lot of people when they're entering the industry and applying for internships, their type of experience is going to look really similar. And so what it often comes down to is how vociferously the people who write your recommendations, write them, you know, like how, like you look at them and you're like, okay, well, this person did student television, but this person did student television. This person's a good GPA, this person has a good GPA. But there's always that recommendation letter where it's like, no, like you've got to take this person for this reason. And that does usually um, put, put them over the top. But, you know, do make things. I, I like to say when I come back and speak to Elon students that it's sort of like create, it's bowling with bumpers. You know, you're not going to get a gutter ball at Elon. It's a safe place to try things over and over again and get feedback that's still constructive and encouraging and in a nurturing environment. This is the, like the only time in your life that'll happen. So, you know, bull, bull while you got the bumpers up. Thank you, Aaron. That's, that's awesome. All right, Rachel. I would consider the Elon and Los Angeles program. Honestly, it is a very literal bridge between campus and industry. And so in the program, yes, we will, I will personally work with you to prepare your materials as well as Ross and the other staff at Elon, but how, you know, positioning your experience, all the things you're doing on campus, which matter, your resume should be full of all of the things from fresh TV to this performance, to this student project, to, you need to demonstrate that you are active on campus, your community, you know, the region, what's happening is, you know, a film festival, are you a volunteer, are you, because your internship in Hollywood is not going to be your first position, there really should be things that show what you're interested in, 
you know, what you're good at on campus. And then we will help bridge you and connect to you to the right people and places. And if you choose to study in Los Angeles, you'll instantly be connected to several hundred alumni who come and speak to our program, who hire interns, who also hire uh, graduates for their first job, and also just being immersed in industry, visiting different studios, production companies. I took my last class actually to Netflix. I know, Michael, you work at Netflix. We were up on the rooftop. We had, we got to walk around. We got to have a presentation and, and hear about all the different departments. And we even had to have lunch. They have a great open pre-COVID where it's like a food court and you can pick anything you want in the Netflix building. So those are the kinds of things of getting immersed in industry and forging connections not thinking about networking as something predatory like this is what i want to get from you but finding ways to build relationships so like eric was saying i just called him up asked some questions and then a year later he thought of me for this it's that it's planting seeds that then you water and will grow and so the great thing is we have programs like elon in los angeles and others that help support you in a in a real way because once you graduate that safety net that support you still have a great alumni support through the university but it's different people are very generous with students when you say oh you know can i ask you about this or what do you do or how about that once you're a real working person people have less time to mentor and foster your learning so now is a great time to do all of this thank you rachel all right mike uh, yeah, sure. I think um, just to add to what Rachel said, I, I think it's really great to show, you know, a, a diverse set of skills, show your strengths and lean into those strengths. Um, and also, like, just realize how massive the industry is. Um, there's a lot of opportunities for things that you might not even realize exist, right? Like, you know, for me, it's like, I, I always loved editing, but like, I'm a whack editor. So it's like, okay, maybe I can't edit like at a high level. So maybe I should do something else, but you can do, you can be a production accountant. You can be a film lawyer. You can do literally any profession that you kind of like or anything that you're ultimately interested in. There is an avenue for that within film and production entertainment as well. So, you know, I, I definitely kind of, like Rachel said, you know, just find out the things that you'd like to do and that you'd be open to doing. And, it, and it's okay if it's not shooting camera and it's okay if it's not uh, editing, you know what I mean? So I think that's probably, you know, the, the biggest thing I would say when you're first going to a new city like, like LA or even New York is just kind of, just realizing that these are massive places with a lot of opportunity that might be a bit out of the box. Uh, so just do some digging and see what you can find. Mike, thanks a lot. All right, Eric. Yeah, I'll do my best to not be totally monotonous here because it's all really good advice. Um, you know, the, the bowling with bumpers stuff, that's, that's a great way to put it. Um, some of the things I, I would say is like, Everyone wants to be creative, but everyone forgets the root word of creative is create. And you guys have that, you know, you have that ability at Elon, you have the, um, you know, you, you can go to a, you can go to that room. I don't know if it still exists, but you can go to a room and check out a camera, like a really nice camera and go shoot your own thing and edit it and like do a full production on it. And nobody's going to tell you, you can't do it. It's, an, it's really a, a cool opportunity. Um, to create and create stuff that you like. Um, gosh, I, I thought I had a, a, another point to kind of add into how to get a job. Um, but uh, honestly, what, what these guys have said is, is right on. There is no pipeline to a certain job that you want. There is no pipeline in media to get to a certain spot. Everybody has a very unique road, it seems like. It's not like, it's not like going into banking and you you, and I don't even know how banking works, but you get an entry level job and then two years later you get a promotion and then you get a promotion. Like that doesn't happen in media. So yeah, it's, it's really just finding your own path. Keep creating what, what you enjoy, keep consuming what you enjoy. And you know, you'll, you'll get somewhere if you keep doing that. It may not be where you thought you'd go, but it's, you'll get somewhere. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, so now I'm going to ask about uh, self-marketing materials. So, uh, you know, I, I see a lot of uh, portfolios and reels and 
resumes. And, and I'm just curious to hear from each of you, and, and I won't call you out in a row again, but, but just what are some, some best practices when, when students are thinking about what's important and what's not important to, to include on things like reels and resumes and portfolios? Um, I guess I can start. Um, I, I think Aaron and Rachel will probably be great resources for this question, um, but I think just what Eric said is, is the most important thing. Create, uh, create, create, and, and don't be afraid to show your work is, is thing number one. Um, you know, I, I don't think anyone's expecting anyone to be A plus level at this time, but uh, you know, I, I personally was very shy about showing my work in the beginning and creating a reel um, and things like that. And, and you know, I, I think it's easier to kind of put yourself out there when you have something to show. And it's also easier to see, or for other people to see kind of uh, what your strengths are and how they can grow you and how they can mentor you. Um, I, I think people are a lot more observant than you might think. Um, and we'll see small attention to detail. Um, so, so I think, you know, creating a real, uh, individual, it sounds like a silly answer, but I think like individuality is really, really important. Um, especially nowadays, I, I think maybe when I was starting out, it was a lot of just kind of like doing, you know, linear storytelling. And that was like the gig, right? But I think now, especially um, at Netflix, one of the things that we look for a lot is this kind of like, what are individual spins that people are putting into their work, right? Like, where's the creativity? Because, you know, all of you have special skills like you know people in, in university are definitely using software earlier people are way more skilled technically than i think like our classes were 10 years ago or so so uh, you know being able to put something on the website is not really enough um you just kind of have to say okay like what makes you stand out you know um it could be that i am this type of editor or I, or I specialize in these types of things but i think you know maybe finding finding a niche and don't be afraid to kind of lean into your own uh you know like inner creativity, inner silliness, inner desire as well, because at the end of the day, you want someone who hires you for you. Um, and if you can get booked by a producer who wants you to do your style, I think that's much better than being booked by someone who wants you to edit by the book or create a, a story by the book. And you kind of feel a bit pigeonholed by that. So that's kind of all I would say. Yeah, I'll pick up there. Um, I think it's a very easy time to build yourself a very clean, aesthetically clean, simple design website with sites like Wix and, and Squarespace where they have portfolio designs and you just drag and drop. And so you can easily put your photographs, you know, embed your Vimeo video clips, all those kinds of things, but pay attention. So if you put something you really like from Vimeo and you embed it in your site, but it automatically plays the next thing that was like that project that you did in the first class in freshman year and you don't want anyone to see it, like yikes, you gotta make sure that anything that's online that has your name fits in your brand as you are now. So in addition to that, social media, you're creating a whole public persona. And it, yes, identity is performative online, you can't be completely absent in this day and age. Then people are wondering, well, why doesn't she have an Instagram if she's in photography or videography or something? But you can't be so visible that it's like every detail of your life that could get in the way of you appearing professional or within boundaries that make sense in this company's brand or mission join the conversations that you want to be in. If you want to be a television writer and you you know, are feeling like, I'm not ready to just be the biggest joke writer on Twitter, follow all the writers, retweet, and just add into the conversation. So whatever, if you want to be an editor, you should be following all the editors. You should be you know, looking at all of the things that they're talking about, going to the articles, the, like get into the conversation. It's, it's a really great time to connect with people doing the things that you want. And so, you know, have your online persona between, you know, your website and your social media handles and then get yourself in these conversations and continue to build update change. So like, you don't wanna have a very old, it's better to not have visual material and just go with some photographs and a bio and your social media handles than to have a, a reel that's really, really old that if you were to play in front of someone and you go, oh, well, not really that and not this shot and not this,
like have the things that you feel best represent you and sometimes less is more and as you build your work then you can put new things and change things up but that's my advice is just make sure that what is public represents you because when you apply for an internship they will look if that link is on your resume they will look and they will also just search for social media handles because now you know they want to know what is this person like what are you bringing to our to our company our workspace our team and i would just add a really specific thing to that which is it's great to create all these things as as rachel says but and and i should only speak specifically to the new york documentary industry too because that's that's what i know uh but in the documentary new york the new york documentary industry um i'd say there's sort of like a sliding scale of how much emphasis is put on each of those things based on how experienced you are so someone applying for an internship or uh, to be a pa or or whatever it might be we really mostly are looking at the resume like we're going to click on the website um maybe we'll click play on the reel um, but for the most part, it's, it's the resume and the recommendations. And what's interesting is like a few jobs in, they're barely going to look at your resume. They're mostly going to look at your website and your reel and your IMDb, right? Because that's where you can get like the quick read and where you're looking more for the, the creative slant that people are going to be able to offer. So for the early stages where the resume is really important, um, clarity is so important and details important you're not going to have as many things like my resume that i send around pretty much just lists the films i worked on and the networks they screened on and the director's names that's all it says right now but when i began and with the people who we look at who are more in y'all's position um, there might only be four things on your resume but i'm interested in what you did in each of those positions to see if that translates well into the type of work that we want to bring you on for because there's an understanding that yes like we'll need to teach specific workflows and you'll con continue to learn on the job that's true for all entry-level positions but we want to be able to see that you've already been put in a position and based on the references succeeded in critical thinking and organization scenarios and communication scenarios and, and all of that so don't think that like this was my first job, second job out of college resume. I'm going to stick to that format throughout my career. It really should be evolving and keep in mind that the emphasis uh, that employers will put on each of those things is going to shift. I'll add really quickly just because I'm not, I'm definitely not a expert in resume building. Um, the only thing I would add is don't be afraid to tailor your your self-marketing towards the job that you want. It, it doesn't have to be, you know, I remember when I applied for college, it was kind of like you, you sent the same thing everywhere and to see what took. It's really not like that in the professional industry. It, it's, it's okay to tailor it towards like, this is a job I'm applying for. I know they do this and this. Here's what I do that kind of fits that. So I'm going to push that to the top and really market that uh, more so than some of the other things that I, that I may have done and I'm proud of, but they're not really going to worry about it. So that's the only thing I'll add. If, if I'm looking at resumes, I'm always looking for that top heavy, wow, that checks, that checks the box of what we do. Not so much just here's everything I've done. Now it's on you, the person looking at the resume to pick the parts that work for you. Um, so I, you know, if I had to do it over again, as far as applying for a first job, I would totally, tailor the uh my resumes and cover letters and, and that sort of stuff to that to that specific job it's not a it's not a one mouse trap will catch all the catch all the mice it's really you gotta spread them out and strategically place them if that analogy holds no it totally does eric thank you all right so so we've got only 15 minutes left which is wild and i've got some questions here from some of our attendees um, and I'll get through as many of these as possible. Um, and the first one I, I think is really interesting and it, it's from Jasmine. This is, what's a piece of advice you wish someone would have told you your semester before graduating? Because she's freaking out a little bit being a senior <laughs> graduating in May. Hmm. 
I guess I can start. <laughs> go um, ahead. Sorry, you got it. You want it? No, you go ahead. You go ahead. All right, but I'll be quick. Um, I, I think, I don't know, I'm trying not to sound too cliche, but I, I, I think that uh, I would just kind of realize that you have more time than you think. Um, you know, don't feel like you have to rush yourself. Don't think you have to rush your progress or your progression. I, I think, you know, you should just enjoy uh, finishing your, your time at Elon. Make sure you finish strong. Make sure you're as productive, productive as you can be. And, you know, try not to kind of judge yourself based on what other people are doing or other friends are doing. Um, uh, no comparative pr production, no comparative uh, joy or suffering. Uh, just kind of focus on yourself and make sure you take care of, of, of business. And I think you'll be you'll be all right as long as you kind of uh, you know that you've done all you can. Um, I, I think that's great. I think it's it's really tough to to always think about oh like I should be doing more. I could be doing more. Um, I think it's it's better to just kind of focus on doing what you're doing now and, and make sure that's that's a plus. You know. Yeah, I mean that's a. I'm not going to lie. That's a tough position to be in. I mean, I remember being there. It's like, and I would think anybody that's on here that's getting ready to graduate has some of the same feelings. Again, it's, it's a different sort of industry. A lot of people don't have jobs lined up coming out. Um, but, you know, something that always kind of gave me, uh, you know, good feelings about where I was headed is like, I'm going to be available, like to, to use a sports term, my best ability is my availability. Like I'm ready to go. Like wherever, whenever the phone rings, I know the phone doesn't really ring anymore. Whenever I get a text or whatever, I see, I see an opportunity, I'm going to go and who knows what it'll be. It's, it's almost, it's more of an exciting time than it feels at the time. If that makes sense. Like this is an exciting time of, there's going to be a lot of opportunities for you. Um, they may not all come at once. They may not all come like the day after graduation day, but they're going to come and just, just be ready to uh, take advantage of them when they do. All right. Let's see here. Just going through all these. I, I feel like some of these have been answered in some way, shape or form. And I want to be cognizant of our time. Um, I like this one. Were there any open doors that you could have taken, but you didn't? And how did declining those things shift your current experience? Hmm. Do you want to go on? Um, no, you, you start. Sure. You know, I now am at a place where I always say I have a lot of meetings to my jobs, like it's a job to get jobs. You meet and have conversations with lots of people. I now lead with questions of, you know, what's the climate like on this show? What is the culture like at this company? You know, I'm old, so I am too old for old toxic Hollywood. And then many of you are very smart and aware and have studied with me and, and Jay on diversity, equity and inclusion. I think it's a great time to ask questions about what is happening in each place and choose the places that support who you are. So I had a dream job that turned into my own personal feminist nightmare and I, I quit. I quit that job. I was on the team that launched Complex Magazine back when we had magazines 20 something years ago. And it was cool, urban skater, hip hop. It was my dream job. I was traveling the world, shooting rappers and models and b-boys and it was incredible. And then it became the men's magazine and it was girls, the best snowboarder in the world in a fur bikini posed contorted around a dog. And I was like, this is, I, I can't bring my daughter to work. This doesn't feel in line with my values. And I quit and that was terrifying to not have the next thing. But in a sense, you go on faith and what you have at the end of the day is who you are, what you stand for, what makes sense for you. And so, you know, we are on a, in an area where you go on faith and you trust yourself and you trust your network of people. And if you reach out to the people in your network and say, you know, I am now available. So, you know, any ideas, keep me in mind. And, you know, it's, it's a little bit scary, but um, there is no reason to work in spaces and places 
that don't make sense for you or the culture doesn't work for who you are and how you see the world. I think that has to shift that even if some of the old Hollywood values don't in some places where now they're being exposed, those showrunners are being fired, those uh, presidents of networks are being removed and that's a good thing, we're shifting. But, you know, do your homework, talk to people, see if there are any Elon alumni at a, at a place and and figure out if it's the right space for you and don't be afraid to say no, which then opens you up for the next thing you haven't even thought of, but it will come to you. Yeah, I would absolutely echo what Rachel says. I, I would say there weren't very many like doors I closed, but there are some that I wish I did. Um, you know, there were instances where I just stayed on projects too long, where, where I didn't recognize that I was being emotionally abused by the person who was writing my paycheck. And, um, you know, I think we're all taught that part of this industry is like the struggle and the hustle. And yeah, but you know what, not the part where people are cruel to you. Like, that's not part of the hustle. It, I mean, it sometimes is, but it, you shouldn't hustle for that. Um, there are increasingly places that uh, hold kindness as supreme. And I feel like I've landed in one of those places and I want to invite as many people into the fold as possible. Um, and, and I know it's scary. And I also hear myself like, yeah, well, listen to her. She's in a privileged position. She can close those doors now. I hear that. It's really scary to close that door. But you're not going to be fostering your, your creativity or your mental health, which is also just so important and so hard, especially right now, if you don't say no to those, or if once you've joined and you say, no, this is, this is wrong, like, listen to that. Um, it doesn't have to be what you do. That's some great advice. Thank you so much. And, and, and I feel like that's stuff that um, just when students are here, they aren't thinking about that yet. It's just, what can I get on my resume? What do I need to do? But we don't only want for you to have a good job after graduation. We want you to have a good life. So you have to think about all these different things. Um, all right, we have time for one more question. And Reese asked if she could actually verbally ask it. So Reese, if you're still here. I am Reese, here. I hate to be that person, but I really wanted to. Be that me. person, Reese. Do it. So I have a statement and I have a question. My statement is first, I wanted to thank Michael for that comforting response about encouraging us to be ourselves because I did ask Jay like a while ago, what's the line between persistence and annoyance? And he said, just don't be annoying and just like, don't be weird. And I said, well, what if that's my personality? <laughs> so, so there's that. So that was, that was refreshing. My second question was, well, does that, this, here's the question, is that they say that the, the struggle with this industry is that it's an art, but it's also a business. And so many times recently I've been told, okay, like you are a brand, you need to promote yourself in this process. You need to be doing everything you can to get noticed. And I want to ensure that I'm still sort of maintaining my like core passion of storytelling while also being able to, you know, showcase who I am in the most effective way. And I was wondering what you think. Um, I can start to answer. Um, to, I mean, to, yes, I 100% feel you. I think that's like a lifelong, at least for me personally, a lifelong struggle um, because, you know, you got to get that bread. So I've, I've done some very silly paranormal reality television shows. I've done all kinds of weird, wild stuff, right? Um, be, because, you know, it is a business and you have to be able to afford to do uh, the hobbies that you do. I, I think you, you can get very lucky, um, you know, but it's, it's quite difficult. So I, I think to start, you know, uh, maybe have the expectation that you might have to work on passion projects or something like that, something to keep you sharp on the side, um, unless if you get really lucky. But I think kind of what, what Aaron and Rachel said, um, during the interview process, you are also interviewing the company, right? You want to make sure that these people that you're going to be working with and working for uh, vibe with you, that they're nice people, that they are creative, that they're doing work that you feel inspired by. I think that's probably the best way to ensure that you are kind of able to bring your best self to work. 
Um, but yes, it's a business. And if you kind of want to work in production, you probably have to live in one of the most expensive cities in the US, if not the world. So, you know, just try to try to keep that in mind that, that you know, there, there will be uh, paranormal ghost reality TV shows in your future too, I'm sure. <laughs> and also as someone who's not very good at building a brand for themselves. I mean, I have a website, you can see the things that I've done and I think it's a pretty website, but you know, I'm not like super quick fingered on Instagram. I don't have Snapchat. Uh, I should have Twitter. Like don't do what I, don't be as bad as me. I'm bad at that. But you know what I'm really good at is branding myself with the people that I know. And remember that like that doesn't happen on social media that happens with following up with the people you enjoyed working with and being friends and not being friends to network. But that was like one of the gross things that was gross and confusing to me when I was in college when people kept saying network. I was like, well, my parents taught me not to use people. And then I realized when I got into the industry that you're not using, you're not using them. You form relationships and, and a, and when you form relationships with people in the industry, it's kind of like friends with benefits, but the benefits are professional. And, uh, you know, they, they, they notice, they, they remember what it's like to work with you and they remember what it's like to socialize with you and they want that in their work environment. And they tell the other people they know and they tell the other people they know. And so, so yes, be good at the social media stuff, but remember all of, your eggs aren't in that basket. It, it, especially, you know, on that same sliding scale, increasingly, increasingly branding will become a little less important on social media and much more important based on the experiences you've had with who you've worked with so far. Well said, thank you. Anyone else want to add to Reese's question or are we good? I mean, I, I can add a little bit. And again, I, I don't know if, again, I, I'm not as qualified to answer it because I work in sports TV where it's, it's a game and you just do the game that you're assigned to. But there are going to be projects that you don't love. I mean, no matter what, there's going to be projects, games, jobs maybe that you don't love. Um, you know, I, I really like my job. I don't like it all the time. I, I say to people, you know, there's a reason they pay you. Um, because you, you go do stuff that you don't want to do. Um, and that's kind of, you know, that, that's kind of work in, in the, in the real world. You guys, even though you're in college, you're in the real world. Um, but you know, it, it's, it's a fine line. You got to walk, uh, to, to try and answer your question. You got, you got to know that this is something that you like, that you don't mind doing the stuff that you don't love. And then eventually maybe, you know, a project will come along or, you know, something unforeseen will come along and it'll be like your, your moment that you love. So, um, you know, that, that's kind of the balance that, that I strike. I, I do plenty of games that I'm not, I'm not psyched to do. Um, but you know, every, every once in a while you, you get one that's like, man, that was a lot of fun. And then you realize like, you know, this, this job is, is what, you know, I, I do like it after all. So, um, you know, like Michael said, you got to get that bread, but you know, it, it doesn't have to be fun all the time. But if you pick, if you pick the right avenue and if, and if you know that's the, the path for you, then, then there will be times where it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel like work. Great. Thanks, Eric. All right. We're at time. Um, and I just want to thank our fantastic panelists for your advice. Let's, let's give them some chat love or some in the screen love. Thank you so much. Um, and I know that all of you are on LinkedIn. So would it be okay if any of our students wanted to reach out? They, they could that way. Absolutely. Okay. Sure. You know that I check my LinkedIn like once every two years. It's one of the ways I'm bad, but <laughs> sure. Ping me. That's all right. That's all right. Um, but, but seriously, thank you so much for this great information. I know that I've learned so much um, and I look forward to staying connected with all of you and I'm going to close down the um, panel, but if our panelists would, would just stay on for, for just a couple of seconds more so we can do a little bit of, of a debrief, but thanks to all of our students, faculty, and staff that showed up. I really appreciate it. It's good to see your faces. Thanks, everybody.
Thank you. Thanks so much, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> he says with a humongous sigh. <laughs> That's the usual reaction that I get. That's thank like, you. <sighs> thank, thank you so much. That, this has been my favorite panel that I've done. I feel like I've learned more in the past hour than I've learned over the past 10 years, honestly, <laughs> about cinema and television. So, so I truly can't thank you enough. And now that I'm thinking about it, let me.